Welcome back to Tales from My Spinner Rack. I'm Gary Sassman, the former director of programming and publications for Comic-Con International San Diego. This is episode six of our ongoing series featuring my nostalgic looks back at the comics I loved and collected as a kid growing up in the 1960s and 70s. This time we look at, well, maybe this is best explained with a song. Hit it, maestro. In America throws its mighty shield. All those who chose to oppose his shield must yield. If he's led to a fight and a duel is due, then the red and the white and the blue will come through when Captain America throws his mighty shield. Yes, this time we're talking about that shield-slinging superstar, Captain America. In fact, we're going to discuss a specific mini-run of O oh Captain, My Captain's Comics, cover dated for 1969, which featured an astounding who's who of Marvel Comics' best artists of the 1960s over eight separate issues. And while I won't be detailing the plots of each story, we will be looking at some amazing pages by each artist, so I may slow down a bit so you can ogle that art. So let's begin, shall we? As Stan Lee himself might say, this is a tale torn from my torturous teens because I was a teenage comic book collector, a definite oddity in my small eastern Pennsylvania coal country town known then and now as Tamaqua. In fact, here's a photo of me with my older brother Rick in our comic collector cave circa 1971, taken for a local newspaper article about those two area freaks who loved comics. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In the late 1960s, one of the highlights of my school-heavy life was my twice-weekly trips to the newsstand for our then version of New Comic Book Day, which was Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's my small town in 1965, with that immortal classic, Bus Riley's Back in Town, featured on the marquee of the glorious Victoria Theater, which I visited many times as a kid. I somehow missed Bus Riley, though, but at only 10 years old, I was too young to appreciate the undeniably winsome and leggy charms of redheaded Anne Margaret. We had two mom-and-pop newsstands in town, Moser's and Brady's, which would eventually become Miller's. Each store also sold tobacco products, candy, sodas, and snacks, in addition to the usual newsstand stuff, like newspapers, magazines, paperback books, and, of course, comic books. Both the Brady's and the Miller's were husband and wife proprietors, older couples who took a shine to me. Most times they would keep the comics wrapped up in their metal-wired stacks from the distributor until I came in after school. They let me unwrap them and pick out the ones in best shape. What we couldn't get at Brady's, we'd find at Moser's, and vice versa. We regularly went from store to store. Either way, both newsstands got in a great selection of comics each week, mainly because they knew they had a captive audience. My brother and me. We bought pretty much everything except romance comics and Archie's. And we even sprung for the occasional issue of that perpetually horny, red-headed, all-American team. Oh, and by the way, none of these photos are of me or the actual newsstands mentioned. Not even the one with the nerdy guy with the glasses, which maybe, sorta, kinda, could have been me if I was 10 years older. They're just good examples of what mom-and-pop newsstands look like in this era. Both Brady and Miller stamped their comics with a date so they knew when to take them off the shelves and return them to the distributor for credit. Sometimes I was able to get to them before they stamped them, so our collection had some books with stamps and some without. I think a lot of mint-only collectors might faint at the sight of these stamped covers, sometimes with the date intact, sometimes smeared. There were a lot of books to stamp, so some of them were not so neatly done. I look back on those stamped comics very fondly. They're almost like a pedigree to me an instant reminder of where and when I bought them. I still have a few of them on my spinner rack today, including this copy of Captain America number 112, a book which ultimately had even greater personal meaning for me, which I'll get to in a bit. Way back in 1940, Jack Kirby and partner Joe Simon co-created Captain America, and it became the most successful of the numerous patriotic superheroes leading into and through World War II. Simon and Kirby jumped ship from Timely, Marvel's company name in the 1940s, to DC National after just 10 issues of Cap. But they had already broken the comics mold with Kirby's spectacular pencils, which refused to be contained within panels and, sometimes, pages. 
Here's a two-page spread from Captain America number eight, November 1941, showing the artistry that separated the Simon and Kirby team from other comic book creators at the time and placed them at the top of the golden age of comics food chain, among the most recognizable names in the industry. They continued together for another 15 years or so of comics greatness, including creating the romance comic genre in the late 1940s. Almost 25 years later, when Captain America came roaring back to life at Marvel in Avengers No. 4, cover dated March 1964, Jack Kirby was there to welcome him. After Cap joined the Avengers, he eventually got his own series in the back half of Tales of Suspense with issue number 59, the November 1964 issue, sharing the book with fellow Avenger Iron Man. Kirby was there then, too, and for the 41 issues of Tales of Suspense that featured Captain America, he drew or did layouts for just about all of them, starting with issue number 59 all the way through to number 99, with only a handful of stories illustrated by the likes of George Tusca, John Romita, Jack Sparling, and Gil Kane. With issue number 100, a solo Captain America series took over the tales of suspense numbering, and Kirby did the first 10 issues, ending with number 109. And here, finally, is where our tale begins. Because for the next eight issues, starting with number 109 from January of 1969, the Captain America series becomes a who's who of Marvel artists of the late 1960s. Kind of a game of musical chairs featuring the company's greatest pencilers, including the last great superhero work of one of comics' brightest and quickest burning stars. I feel this Captain America run took place during Marvel's absolute high point in the late 1960s. In a lot of ways, it didn't get much better than this for the company. It's also during this time that the price of comics jumped from 12 cents to 15 cents, which to me at least, signified the end of the Silver Age of comics, which is probably a topic we could debate endlessly. But I digress. Jack Kirby returned to the Cap feature full-time with Tales of Suspense number 92, and he brought his Fantastic Four anchor, Joe Sinnott, with him. Kirby and Sinnott did the series until number 98, when Sinnott split the inking chores with Golden Age artist Sid Shores, who continued to ink Kirby on Cap's solo series in issues 100 through 103 and 107 to 109. Shores had been a regular penciler of Captain America after Simon and Kirby left the strip in the early 1940s. After serving in World War II, he returned to Time Lee as art director and continued working in comics, most often for Stan Lee, until he died in 1973. To be honest, I never liked Shores inking on Kirby on these books. To me, at least, he was very heavy-handed with the ink and gave Kirby's art an old-fashioned look. So let's look at this eight-issue run, starting with Captain America number 109, written by Stan Lee, penciled by Jack Kirby, and inked by Sid Shores, January 1969. Captain America number 109 is another retelling of the origin of the character, maybe as a setup to what was coming next in issue number 110, the return of a sidekick for Cap. The last time his full origin had been retold was in Tales of Suspense number 63, March 1966, which time jumped the character back to World War II era stories for a spell. In issue number 109, Steve Rogers goes all introspective, a major part of the character since he returned in Avengers number 4 and relates to Nick Fury how he became Captain America through the miracle of Vita Rays, not the super serum that permeates Marvel continuity to this day, and how he still grieves for his lost pal, Bucky Barnes. I like Kirby's pencils on this issue. He's definitely into his big panel era here. At this time, Kirby was pulling away from creating new characters for Marvel and concentrating mainly on Fantastic Four and Thor, although he would contribute to the first few issues of the two new split books, with an Inhuman series in Amazing Adventures and a Kzar one in Astonishing Tales. This would be his last regularly scheduled issue of Captain America. In a year or so, he'd move over to DC and start his fourth world saga, featuring the New Gods, the Forever People, Mr. Miracle, and Darkseid. He'd return to Marvel and Captain America with issue number 193, January 1976, with Cap being one of the only two characters he previously worked on for Marvel that he was willing to do again on a regular basis in series form. The other one was Black Panther, another character he co-created. But hang on, 
Kirby was not quite done with Captain America in this run. Captain America number 110, written, penciled, and colored by Steranko and inked by Joe Sinna, February 1969. I don't remember when I first learned that Jim Steranko was taking over the Captain America series with issue number 110. It may have been the exact moment when I first saw the issue on the newsstand and held it in my grubby little hands. And for the record, I still have little hands, but they're not so grubby. I was absolutely thrilled by Steranko taking over Cap. I can't begin to tell you what a shock to the system Steranko was when he first came to Marvel Comics in the middle of 1966. Starting with his work on Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., Steranko was a giant breath of fresh air in comics. He combined the dynamic figure work of Jack Kirby with the cinematic storytelling of Will Eisner, including a detailed style reminiscent of Wally Wood. He was in a word, cool, all caps, something you couldn't say about most of his contemporaries in comics. His work was different than anything else being published then, except maybe the work of that other new young Turk, Neil Adams, who had burst onto the scene with a hyper-realistic style over at DC. But for me, at least, Steranko was head and shoulders above Adams. In addition to penciling cap number 110, Steranko also wrote and colored it. And man, that coloring is amazing in and of itself. Even with the limited printing abilities of late 1960s comics, especially at Marvel, these issues stood out when it came to just the coloring alone. I'm also guessing he designed the new Captain America logo on the cover, which we'll see in close-up in a minute. He had done a similar redesign for X-Men in the very short run, just two issues plus an additional cover, that he had done right before taking over Cap. There's that logo. Oh, and let's not forget, even though it's out of story sequence here, one important thing Steranko brought back from that initial Simon and Kirby run a quarter of a century earlier. Those incredibly dynamic and wide-screen cinematic two-page spreads. Each of Steranko's issues in his cap run features a center spread featuring one giant action-packed image. Captain America number 111. Written, penciled, and colored by Steranko and inked by Joe Sinna, March 1969. Cap number 111 is another tour de force for the writer-artist, once again showcasing incredible page layouts from the poster-worthy cover to that amazing colorful splash page to a pair of Salvador Dali-esque full-page sequences of a drugged Rick Jones and a thrilling climax featuring the possible death of Cap and yet another reviewer two-page spread featuring Cap battling a trio of goons who are kidnapping Rick. Again, this was art you didn't see in your comics every day in 1969. This is my favorite of the three-issue arc by Steranko. Everything just clicks, and I wish I could recapture reading it again for the very first time. And Joe Sinnott, who inked both this issue and the previous one, was the perfect inker for Steranko, in my humble opinion. He never looked better, even when he inked himself. Steranko created Madame Hydra as the villain in this three-part story arc. And he definitely put the boom in his va va boom design for the character. She's certainly more menacing and alluring than other Hydra bosses, with the possible exception of Steranko's own depiction of Baron Strucker, who is not so alluring, but definitely menacing. And she makes a memorable villain for this story. This was a Captain America for a new generation, and I truly believe it's also Steranko's finest hour in superhero comics. It's unfortunate it would also be a swan song in that genre. Captain America number 112, written by Stan Lee, penciled by Jack Kirby, and inked by George Tuska, April 1969. Legend has it that Stranko was late with the third part of his first Captain America story, but he insists he was never late with any of his work at Marvel. He does admit to turning his pages in at the last possible minute, though, just so Stan and company couldn't change anything. This might have been too terrifying a game of chicken for Stan this time. And if so, he blinked and had Jack Kirby create Captain America number 112 reportedly over a weekend in order to get the book to the printer on time. This is an album issue, one that recaps Cap's life through the eyes of fellow Avenger Iron Man as Tony Stark picks up the phone to find out Captain America, and more importantly, Steve Rogers, has died in battle. We know better, of course, reread number 111, 
and know it was Cap's need to once again have a secret identity that caused him to fake his own death. So Cap 112 picks up just where 111 left off as the police pull Cap's costume, all they can find of him, out of the bay and dives headfirst, kind of like Cap did at the end of number 111, into Stark's emotional recap of the Star-Spangled Avengers' heroic career. If indeed Kirby did create Cap number 112 in just a few short days, it's an amazing achievement. Once again, it's a lot of big panels and full pages, but they're all great. Even George Tuska's inking, an unusual choice as Tuska penciled Cap for a spell over Kirby layouts in the middle of the Tales of Suspense run, is good, and probably also signifies Stan's scrambling to get this book out the door by not using one of his usual Kirby inkers. Another thing that possibly points out to how quickly this book was put together had a personal impact on me. Stay tuned for that story after we finish discussing this run of Cap stories. Captain America number 113. Written, penciled, and colored by Starenko and inked by Tom Palmer. May 1969. Just a quick look at another amazing splash page. Again, totally different from anything else appearing in comics in 1969. Steranko returns for issue 113, sadly his final issue. Supposedly Stan scheduling the last minute Kirby issue for 112 caused Steranko to lose interest in doing the book, or maybe he had just signed on for three issues, who knows. It's another blockbuster though, possibly because it was completed before Stan jumped the gun with the emergency Kirby issue in number 112. Madame Hydra's origin is told in a stunning full page. Steranko's version of the Avengers look a little wispy to me, but his funeral for Cap is touching and features a great use of color. There is yet another two-page spread where Cap explodes back into life on a motorcycle, saving Nick Fury and the Avengers from being buried alive. Steranko chronicles the fight with Hydra with an iconic splash page, plus an amazing black and white explosion to end the menace of Madame Hydra, at least for now, and a bonus two-page spread to end the story. Stranko would do only two more stories for Marvel. The first was the lead story in Tower of Shadows No. 1, Marvel's new suspense book, which started in September 1969. Unfortunately, that story, At the Stroke of Midnight, which Stranko wrote, penciled, inked, and colored, caused a bit of a problem between Stan and Jim, as the artist related in the 1969 interview. Quote, The reason I had a little altercation with them is because they edited some of my work. They changed certain things that I didn't feel should be changed, and I insisted that we couldn't continue on that basis. For example, my horror story, At the Stroke of Midnight, had a line of dialogue added. We had disagreements about the way I told stories. If you're a publisher and you want my work, you get it my way, or you don't get it at all. Unquote. Stranko and Stan evidently made up, but not without Stan rejecting Steranko's very different cover design for Tower of Shadows No. 1. If this was the final coloring on this cover, it's light years away from any other cover in 1969, and maybe even today. The final story Steranko did for Marvel was in their new romance title, Our Love Story, which also utilized Marvel's great stable of artists, including John Romita, John Buscema, and Gene Colan. In other words, most of the same artists that made this run of Captain America comics so memorable. My Heartbroken Hollywood appeared in issue number five, the June 1970 issue, and once again, it's as different as anything could be in comics at that, that, at that time, romance genre or otherwise, steeped in fashion illustration and Peter Max-like design. Stranko wrote, penciled, inked, and colored it, and it's made this issue of Our Love Story the most sought after for collectors more than 50 years later. After Steranko left Marvel in 1970, he would create and publish the first four issues of Foom magazine, the house organ of Marvel's new fan club called Friends of Old Marvel, which he ran out of his Reading, Pennsylvania home for a short period of time, alongside his own company, Super Graphics. Foom would last for 22 issues, but sadly, Steranko would only do the first four of them, published in 1973. You can definitely see his style and design sense in them, though. In addition to painting numerous paperback covers at this time, including the Shadow series, Steranko created and published Comic Scene, 
a bi-monthly tabloid newspaper featuring comics news and features, which eventually morphed into media scene, and then finally became Preview Magazine, both of which covered the world of movies. Preview featured a catalog of pop culture stuff for sale in its back pages that was often more entertaining to read than the actual articles. He also created two volumes of the Steranko History of Comics, a fascinating and beautiful, large-format historical tome with that distinctive Steranko flavor, both design and content-wise. We're all still waiting for Volume 3, but me? I'd settle for a deluxe reprint of the first two volumes on better paper and in hardback. Fun fact, Reading, PA was only about an hour away from my hometown of Tamaqua. And at one point, I sent Steranko a letter volunteering to help with super graphics. Surprisingly, he wrote back. The postcard is sadly undated, and I don't remember it was, if it was before or after I went to art school. But it was worth saving all these years just for his handwriting. His reply read, Gary, thanks for the offer to help with super graphics. At the moment, I cannot use your services, but perhaps in the future, the opportunity will present itself. Have you had any experience inking pencil drawings with pen or brush? How about paste up of copy? How about writing experience? Let me know. Perhaps there will be something coming up. Till then, take care. Steranko. I didn't own a car or even drive at that point, so the whole thing went nowhere, especially when my mom said, no, you're not going to work in Reading and stay at some strange man's house. But mom... Life goes on. Captain America number 114, written by Stan Lee, penciled by John Romita, and inked by Sal Buscema, June 1969. Stan and company must have been shocked by Steranko's sudden departure off the series, because the next couple issues feel like fill-ins, designed to keep the book going until they could decide on a more permanent replacement. Number 114 brought John Romita, that's J.R. Sr. for you youngsters out there in YouTube land, into the fold once again. Ramita handled the Co Captain America stories in the very brief Atlas superhero revival of the big three timely heroes, Cap, Submariner, and the Human Torch, in the mid-1950s, brought about by the success of the Adventures of Superman TV series. His style then was definitely influenced by Milton Kniff. This was the era of Captain America Commie Smasher, as the covers trumpeted. Ramita had done one cap short story in Tales of Suspense, issues 76 and 77, the latter with Jack Kirby, but his main job at Marvel in this time period was, of course, The Amazing Spider-Man. Captain America number 114 picks up the pieces of the Steranko story, with Cap's Steve Rogers' identity left in the bay with his costume. It focuses on Cap's concern for the career choice of the love of his life, S.H.I.E.L.D. Agent 13 also known as Sharon Carter. Oh, and Rick Jones is still trying to be Bucky. Stop trying to make Bucky happen, Rick. I may be wrong, but a couple of pages look a little bit like John Buscema to me. Or maybe it's just Brother Sal's inks. Oh, and Cap's arch enemy, the Red Skull, returns, once again in possession of the all-powerful Cosmic Cube, Marvel's equivalent of the Swiss Army Knife. Did you think a mere disguise could hide you from the Red Skull? I'm all for Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Red Skull. I don't know about you. Ramita's work on Cap is not as flashy or designy as Steranko, but his style always features clear, solid storytelling and dynamic figure work. And oh yeah, beautiful women. Hey, Agent 13. How you doing? Captain America number 115. Written by Stan Lee. Penciled by John Buscema and ink by Sal Buscema, July 1969. Captain America number 115 featured art by Big John Buscema, picking up the pencil from cohort Jazzy Johnny Ramita. But the cover for this issue, despite featuring a very John Buscema-like version of Agent 13, is actually by Maurice Severin, Frank Giacoya, and Frank Brunner, although I'm not quite sure which part Brunner worked on. He had a very distinctive art style, as evidenced in his Doctor Strange and Howard to Duck work, but it's not readily apparent here. Maybe the Red Skull? Issue 115 continues with the latest installment in the ongoing saga of one of Marvel's greatest love affairs, the Red Skull and his beloved Cosmic Cube. Basically, in this Stanley written tale, the Skull goes nuts on Captain America, 
screwing with his mind, and ending up with the classic Marvel switcheroo, where the Red Skull takes over Cap's body, and Cap is stuck in the Skull's body. A Freaky Friday variation that Stan the Man utilized a number of times, especially with Reed Richards and Doctor Doom. Buscema's art is great in this issue, published when he was concentrating on the Avengers, but before he took over Fantastic Four and Thor from a departed Jack Kirby. Buscema is allowed to go a little nuts in this issue due to the awesome powers of the Cosmic Cube, while the Red Skull sends Captain America through the ringer, which includes a free trip through various dimensions, a la Doctor Strange. Both this issue and the previous Ramita drawn one were inked by John's brother, Sal Buscema, who, it's worth noting, will go on to pencil a long run of Captain America books on his own in the 1970s, on and off from issue number 146 through number 188, and then again from number 218 through number 237, plus a couple of issues after that. Sal also did long runs on The Incredible Hulk, The Defenders, and Spectacular Spider-Man, in addition to a long collaboration inking the work of penciler Ron Friends on Spider-Girl. Captain America number 116. Written by Stan Lee, penciled by Gene Colan, and inked by Joe Sinop. August 1969. Finally, with issue number 116, Captain America sorta of, kinda of found a semi permanent penciler in Gene the Dean Colan, who was quite the workhorse on Marvel superhero books at this time. He had started his career at Marvel with Submariner, then added Daredevil and Iron Man and did a bit of fill-in work on the Avengers just before jumping over to Cap. This first issue in Colin's Cap run continued the Red Skull Cosmic Cube storyline, wherein the Skull, still in Captain America's body, finds that love conquers all when Agent 13, Sharon Carter, refuses to kill the Red Skull, who is still Cap, as the Skull quite philosophically proclaims, I failed, I should have known, the only thing which not even the cube can overcome is the emotion of love. Aw, now that's a Valentine's Day card. I was lukewarm to Colin's superhero work, to be honest. I thought he was better suited to Daredevil, whose costume lent itself to the kind of dark, noirish look Colin excelled at, especially in his Tomb of Dracula epic run. Colin's sometimes wonky panel arrangements somehow worked better for me on Daredevil 2 than in his other superhero work but his work always depended on a good inker, and there was no one better than Tom Palmer for him, as evidenced by that Dracula run. Joe Sinnott tries his best here, but he's not a great fit for Colin, and Colin isn't a great fit for Cap either, in my humble opinion. Obviously, Stan didn't consult me, because Gene Colin would continue as the artist on Cap until issue number 137, so Stan sort of got his permanent artist, at least for a couple of years. Colin co-created The Falcon, with Stan Lee in his second Cap issue, number 117, September 1969. And Cap once again had a new partner, which also made new cast member Sam Wilson the first Black American superhero to appear regularly in a Marvel title. The Black Panther was a resident of Wakanda, remember? Despite trying to make it as Cap's new sidekick, Rick Jones was left stranded at the altar once again at least until Roy Thomas and Gil Kane adopted him as Captain Marvel's better half when they revamped that character in October 1969. He was a much better fit with that captain and gave the character an earthbound anchor. The Falcon got cover building with Cap starting with issue number 134, February 1971, thus making the partnership official. The book was called Captain America and the Falcon, at least on the cover, until issue number 192, December 1975 skipping number 193, and continuing from number 194 through 222, but inside the book continued to be called Just Captain America. John Romita took over the series for a short run with issue number 138, lasting through number 145 alongside Gil Kane on that issue, often inking his own pencils and redesigning the Falcon's costume into a much more colorful and spiffier red and white version. Jack Kirby's return with issue number 193, January 1976, had the King writing, penciling, and editing the title until number 214, the October 1977 issue. His run included Captain America's Bicentennial Battles, a giant-sized treasury edition from 1976 that had John Romita, Barry Windsor Smith, and Herb Trimpey on inks. 
but this run wasn't exactly Kirby's finest hour on the character and would mark his last association with Cap 37 years after, after he co-created him in 1940 with Joe Simon. I'm fondest of Kirby's Tales of Suspense Cap stories, especially the ones from number 92 through number 99, before Cap and Iron Man got their own titles. Most of them are inked by Joe Sinop. That run also introduced MODOK in Tales of Suspense number 94, which stands for Mental Organism Designed Only for Killing. MODOK is one of Kirby's most bizarre Marvel villains. Arnim Zola is a close second in that list. But MODOK has sadly steered away from the Kirk King's original design in recent years, especially the horrible CGI version in Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, which I can't even bring myself to show. It's too painful. Kirby's cover for Tales of Suspense 98, featuring Cap and the Black Panther going at it, Shield and Claw, is one of my all-time favorites by the King. Note that at this point, Marvel was referring to the Black Panther as just the Panther, undoubtedly due to political reasons. But those three issues of Captain America by Steranko stand out the most for me from this run, and maybe for all of Cap's many issues. I don't know if it was his intention to continue with the series, but if it was, who knows what he may have come up with. As fond as I am of his Nick Fury Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. work, these three Cap issues are the absolute pinnacle of Steranko's all-too-short period of time at Marvel in the late 1960s. I think these issues are Steranko's legacy at Marvel, and in superhero comics in general. If you're going to go out, go out on top, and the writer artist certainly did so with this mini-epic. Over the next 45 years, many other artists would take on Captain America, from the sublime, Steve Epting, to the ridiculous, Rob Liefeld. But for me, this eight-issue run is the cream of the cap crop, circa 1969. It doesn't get much better than Jack Kirby, Jim Steranko, John Romita, John Buscema, and Gene Colan. I hope the art presented in this episode proves that. One last thing. Remember I mentioned that Captain America number 112 had great personal meaning to me? Well, let's go back and take a gander at one particular page in that issue, really two panels, that was supposedly put together over a weekend by artist and undoubtedly plotter Jack Kirby. My 14-year-old eagle eyes spotted something amiss in this little sequence, which is very hard to see. In the second of three panels on this page, Cap and Bucky are in costume on a motorcycle, speeding towards Baron Zemo and his Nazi goons to stop an enemy drone plane from being launched. But in the third panel, when they reach the plane, I guess in the border between panels, Cap and Bucky switch out of their costumes into overalls, blue onesies to be exact. I promptly took pen to paper and fired off a missive to Stan Lee and company to point out that this egregious mistake and to demand my official Marvel no prize in return. Marvel at that point gave out no prizes to the first reader who pointed out a continuity error. I'm not sure how many readers were then reading their Marvel comics with a magnifying glass, which I most certainly must have been doing at this point, since I never would have caught this error today, when even my glasses need glasses to see properly. But lo and behold, a few weeks later, an envelope appeared in my mailbox. I had been officially awarded a Marvel No Prize. It's postmarked February 5th, 1969. Cap number 112 had hit my local newsstand on January 7th, thanks to the date stamp on my copy. So they were pretty quick on the draw with this. I remember coming home from school and my mom handing it to me and saying, I think someone opened this and took something out of it because it's empty. It also evidently absolutely befuddled our mailman, a golfing buddy of my dad's named Donnie, who bore no resemblance to Willie Lumpkin, Marvel's favorite postal delivery person. Willie, I mean Donnie, implored my mom to contact the sender and ask him to resend it with my undoubtedly valuable no prize intact. I had a hell of a time convincing my mom that no, this was it. It's meant to be an empty envelope. It's a joke kind of thing. But she never did understand. And me? Well, I couldn't have been prouder to have received a genuine Marvel no prize. So proud, in fact, that I still have it to this day, 55 years later, framed and sitting triumphantly on a shelf full of Marvel books. The end. Now, how's that for a happy ending?
Please stay tuned for some important promotional announcements. Tales from My Spinner Rack started a little over a year ago as a series of posts on my blog at www.innocent-bystander.com. After doing presentations at both WonderCon and San Diego Comic-Con in 2023, I decided to switch from just writing and showcasing scanned art from my comics collection via blog posts over to video presentations here on YouTube. You can visit the entire written Tales from My Spinner Rack archive, featuring close to 40 posts, including books from the Silver Age of Comics, with tons of scanned images, including covers, story pages, and even some original art. Just visit www.innocent-bystander.com and click on any box on the homepage, and then click on Tales from My Spinner Rack in the category list on the right-hand side of the page to access the full archive. I guarantee hours upon hours of fun reading, and if you don't agree, well, I don't know what you can do about it. Check out my other episodes of Tales from My Spinner Rack here on YouTube, including Episode 1 featuring And Lo, There Shall Be a Spinner Rack, which includes my own secret origin as a comics fan. Episode 2 features the recreation of my WonderCon 2023 panel, featuring Batman's most disgraceful story, Batman Becomes Bat Baby. Episode 3 recreates my San Diego Comic-Con 2023 panel, Jimmy and Lois, Jimmy and Lois, poor, poor Lois, still, Jimmy and Lois, still crazy after all these years. Please forgive that mistake. I love Jimmy and Lois. While Episode 4 chronicles my quest to purchase all the Marvel comics published in December 1965. Episode 5 features my favorite 1960s Superman stories, four of the most wonderful super stories from the Mort Weisinger edited era. And there's much more to come here in 2024. Please like, comment, and subscribe here on YouTube, and turn on notifications to find out when I post new videos. Just don't tell Lois that I called her Lewis. If you're watching this, you're already here, so come on, share the love. And please give our little buddy Bat Baby a look-see over in Episode 2. He's dying for your attention. Please follow me on Instagram at Tales from My Spinner Rack. It's all one word. Or if you want to stalk me personally, you can follow me at GG92118. And please let me know you visited by leaving likes and comments. But be nice, okay? The world is pretty rough these days, and it just seems to be getting rougher, especially on social media. We'll be back soon with another brand new Tales from My Spinner Rack episode, which just might make its world premiere at WonderCon 2024. Stay tuned for more info on that. Thanks for watching. Good night.